Welcome to First. I'm Mark Eichmann along with Shirley Min and Michelle Polston. There are more empty seats in some Delaware public schools than ever before. But even though the population is in decline, that doesn't mean costs are coming down. The expansion of some business in Delaware is always a good news story for the economy. But overall, how are we doing? We'll talk to the head of the Delaware State Chamber of Commerce for a status report. Lola Soul hopes to remain one of those economic good news stories. We'll report this week on how a name change helped boost brand awareness. A little marketing lesson this week on First. It's your public media news magazine, and it all starts now. In this era of school choice, one in five K-12 students are now attending schools outside their home district, but the trend is having devastating effects on one upstate school district. Delaware Education reporter Chris Barish is here with our first look. Hi, Chris. Hi, Nikki. A total of 8,700 students from Christina School District attend non-district schools. That's 38 percent, far more than any other district in the state. This growing problem has left several schools far below capacity, especially Christina's three traditional high schools. The exodus of students from Christina is also costing taxpayers millions of dollars annually. When Christiana High School hosted Conrad Schools of Science in football in September, the scene was a microcosm of the state of affairs in Christina School District. Christiana had just 25 players, less than half a typical team. And in the home stands, only about 50 people cheered for the Vikings. Conrad's team was twice as big and had a couple of hundred rooters. Conrad rolled over Christiana 34 to nothing. The lopsided score serves as a metaphor for the exodus of Christina students to charter schools in other districts, 38 percent, most in the state by far. We definitely have capacity in our buildings and we have the space to be in two high schools and not three based on our current student populations. Um, there's conversations that have been simmering for a long time now about that issue. Each year there's more empty seats. The problem is worst at its three high schools, Christiana, Glasgow, and Newark. Together they are at less than half capacity. Enrollment is so low you could close Christiana, send its 722 students to the two other schools, and still have 1,050 empty desks. Trisha Stallings, whose son is a Christiana freshman, was stunned by its emptiness. Before they moved to the district, he was headed to Colonial's William Penn, which has nearly 2,100 kids. When we brought him here to Christiana, I figured, okay, well, it's about the same amount, but then it was like, oh, it's only 700 students. Oh, okay, that's a huge difference. The flight from Christina does have policymakers talking about shuttering buildings. They're aging and cost millions of dollars a year to maintain. Officials recently began a capacity analysis. If you don't have students, because in Delaware the money follows the student, if you don't have enough students in the school, you don't have enough money to offer that type of programmatic diversity. If the capacity analysis yielded that we could offer better program for our kids, then I think closure would be something that we could or should look at. SHU Middle School teacher Mike Kemsky hates seeing classrooms empty and repairs unaddressed. We lose somebody every year. Some position goes away and you can track and you just seem to be on this downward uh, spiral of contracting instead of expanding. Governor John Carney recently toured Bancroft Elementary and Byer Middle Schools with new superintendent Richard Gregg. Both schools are barely 30 percent full. The Christiana board and administration will obviously have to make some hard decisions. Nobody likes to close schools, but you don't want to have buildings that are half full, and that's a, that's a real challenge for us. Gregg, a Glasgow grad who took over Christina in April, would not speak with WHYY on camera. Instead, his spokeswoman issued a statement saying Greg, quote, considers underutilized buildings a challenge. Officials denied WHYY's informal request for an estimate, as well as our formal freedom of information request for the cost in 2016 to maintain Christiana High, including custodial staff, utilities, and upkeep. They wrote, quote, there are no reports that provide the information you request. Young said taxpayers should be concerned about maintaining half-empty schools. The costs, I would say, are 
prohibitive. I would say certainly close to at least a million or more per school. So where do the 8,700 students who opted out of the Christina District go to school? Nearly two-thirds go to charter schools, a trend that keeps rising. They're going towards something that works for their kid. Some kids don't do well in those big, comprehensive high schools. They thrive in a smaller, more family-like setting. The biggest recipient of Christina students, with 2,200, is two-time National Blue Ribbon winner Newark Charter. Several other charters have hundreds of Christina kids. Five are in Wilmington, Coomba, Edison, Great Oaks, Eastside, and Friere. Others include Odyssey, Charter of Newcastle, MOT Charter, Las Americas Aspira, Academy Antonio Alonso, and Delaware Design Lab. 1,800 Christina students also attend Newcastle County's vocational technical schools. About 1,400 choice into another district, mostly to Red Clay schools such as Conrad, Cap Calloway School of the Arts, and A.I. DuPont High School and Middle School. Two other Red Clay affiliated schools, Wilmington Charter and Delaware Military Academy, also have plenty. Perception is, is always a key in our, in our business education. I, I think uh, one thing we've been able to do with seven high schools, which are all themed, uh, gives us our residents a great option to what's best for their daughter or son. Dissatisfaction led Tara Ann Williams to send her daughter to Free Air Charter. There's a lack of discipline within the schools with some of the kids, and it causes the kids that are really there for their education to take a step back and not want to be involved. At a Friere open house, Williams and her child had positive interactions with faculty members. We liked the way they answered, and last year she excelled. She blew up. She had honor roll all four marking periods. She captain of her cheerleading team. Another reason cited for the exodus is that Christina has had several superintendents in recent years and didn't embrace the charter movement. That discontinuous leadership really, I think, uh, contributed to us not having a consistent message or the ability to react as nimbly as we needed to. Young and others are cognizant that taxpayers foot the hefty bill to maintain half-empty schools. Doing a capacity analysis is the first step in being able to make decisions that are informed and not decisions that are, that are based on maybe just a momentary trend. If they are that under capacity in their schools, they should consider closing one of those schools. Christina is trying to bring back kids. We're working hard on putting programs in place at the schools that would hopefully attract students to want to stay so that we wouldn't have this excess capacity. Some say the district should capitalize on its respected music curriculum to start an art school like Cab Calloway. But should these strategies fail, the fate of schools with proud legacies could hang in the balance. I can tell you if you tried to close Glasgow, I'm an alumni of Glasgow, I'd be very upset. My husband, who went to Christiana High School, would not like to see his building um, sold or raised, and, and my daughter, who graduated from Newark. There are people who say, you can't close Newark, it's Newark. So I'm really glad that there's that amount of school pride amongst our high schools to know that that's going to be a battle. That's a good battle. That's a good problem to have. It remains to be seen how Christina will deal with so many half-empty buildings. But during a brief off-camera conversation with Superintendent Gregg, during his recent tour of Bancroft, he told me he's exploring ways to draw students back to Christina's schools, not which ones could be closed. His quote, I'm not ready to give up any of our buildings. I get the impression, Chris, that officials weren't too cooperative at, this, at Christina School District. How did you deal with the resistance? Well, when I learned about the story in the spring, I did some quick research and analysis and contacted the district for some preliminary feedback. And the response was pretty antagonistic as if, you know, how dare we ask legitimate questions about a growing problem. We tried to interview the superintendent when we started working on the story, and after a few days, that was denied. We tried to get into one of the high schools with a principal to get a tour and discuss the issue. That was denied. The only reason we got into Bancroft Elementary was because Governor Carney was doing a tour and he invited the press. Quick thinking on your part. Uh, tell me, very interesting that the district would not provide any financial information on how they maintain their schools. Can they prevent taxpayers from knowing how money is spent? Well, I hope not. It's public money. Uh, it was very troubling to us that if I was a taxpayer, a parent, or a lawmaker, I might be outraged by this. They wouldn't even tell us the salaries of the top administrators at Christiana High School, which is preposterous. So we'll be appealing this to Attorney General Matt Den. He's a champion of public disclosure, 
and we'll see how it goes. Okay, thanks so much, Chris, for bringing this story to life. You have plenty of follow-up stories ahead as you continue to investigate. For those of you at home, you can find this and other stories by Chris online at whyy.org slash news. So secret that Delaware is a blue state, so we'd have to assume that President Trump's affection for Twitter has an effect on some of us. Does it affect Rob Torno? Let's ask him. <laughs> so Rob, uh, talk us through this cartoon. Uh, seems like Trump is giving uh, some red meat to a certain portion of, of Delaware's population, especially in the southern part of the state. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's funny that we're such a small state, right? Sussex County is about an hour's drive away, yet we have two vastly different ways of looking at this presidency. You know, just in the last couple weeks, you know, we We've failed to refund the CHIP program. That affects 18,000 Delaware kids. You know, we almost destroyed Obamacare. And we're undermining the health care. You know, Anthem in Delaware has issues. Um, so it's funny how we're only separated by the small distance, yet we look at him in a vastly different way. It's just, just odd and fascinating. And that has a, a, a influence on the way you look at his presidency, whether the things that he's done or failed to do are really good things right. or, or not. Right, yeah, I mean, you know, he won Sussex County overwhelmingly, almost two to one, and, you know, we don't have much recent polling, but just driving around, it doesn't seem like any of that support has waned. Um, yeah, it's just odd, especially when he's affecting our state negatively. You know, his populist tax cut plan, it's going to the people in Greenville, not to the people in Sussex County, yet they still overwhelmingly support him. It's just... It doesn't permeate, I guess. <laughs> All right. Uh, always an adventure, just like the president's tweets. Yep. You can follow Rob Torno on Twitter. He is at Rob Torno. Thanks, Rob. No sweat. Coming up on First, Lola Soul offers a cool name and a creative way to turn a passion into a new enterprise. And if that isn't enough, experience the work of a retired UD professor. Proof that passion comes in all shapes and sizes. A chance encounter sparked a business idea for a Wilmington woman. Kamisha Martin took that concept, stepped out on faith, and created a fearless line of jewelry under the brand name Lola Soul. There is an entrepreneurial movement underway in Wilmington, Delaware. From traditional to creative ventures, people are turning their passion into a profession. My name is Kamisha Martin. I am a metalsmith jewelry designer and I am the owner of Lola Soul Jewelry. Martin started making jewelry for herself after she was duped into believing a piece of jewelry she bought from a vendor was a one-of-a-kind piece. I saw at least five people with the exact same ring and since that time I have seen lots of people with that exact same ring. So I said lies and deceit this is not one of a kind. The only way I'm truly gonna have something one of a kind is if I make it myself. So I took a weekend class um, just to learn the basics of how to make jewelry. No longer needing to depend on other jewelry makers, Martin started modeling her own creations, which caught the eye of several people. People would stop me in the street and say, hey, I love your necklace, where'd you get it from? I'm like, oh, I made it. Oh my gosh, did you sell it? I'm like, no, do 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 do, you know, skip off. After the 30th person said, do you sell that jewelry? I was like, light bulb moment, maybe I should start selling this jewelry. Martin is a part of the business boom that online brand Thrillist says is happening in Wilmington. A 2016 study of women-owned businesses by American Express Open shows a 45% jump in businesses started by women. That's in comparison to a 9% hike among all businesses. It was very scary. I mean, I was working for a very major, you know, Fortune 50 company, um, making, you know, really good money. And I was willing to walk away from that. Martin is among Wilmington's boss babes, a term used on social media to describe women who run their own businesses. In 2014, she fired her corporate job and made the leap into self-employment. When I decided to become Lola Soul, I had to take on it as a real business because this is how I was gonna pay my bills now. So I had to get very serious about it. She admits to being too rigid with her marketing and sales approach in the beginning. But with experience came wisdom coupled with a twist of creativity. It used to be called Lola Soul Session, but I thought it didn't really give you an idea of what we did. So then Metal with a Twist really helps you to understand what we do here. It's about you coming here and you deciding what you want to make in the realm of what we're making 
and you design it, you make it, and you take it. Martin went from not only selling her jewelry at festivals, boutiques, and online, to offering buyers a chance to create their own one-of-a-kind piece of jewelry. Let's make some fearless pieces. Today we are doing initial pendants. I know there is someone here who wants to make a ring. Who is that person? Okay. So there's usually two classes. There's usually the initial pendants and then there's the ring. That's this ring here. And so she wants to make this ring. So if someone else wants to make this ring, I will walk you through making this ring as well. So there's options today. The hands-on class gives students a glimpse inside the art of jewelry making. It was interesting. Um, it's not as easy as you think. So there are a lot of things that you have to get used to in terms of working with hot metal and the fire and the soldering and all of those things. Um, and so, but it's fun. Martin says students walk away from her class, which is offered at Belfine Arts in Wilmington with a sense of fearlessness. And that's exactly what she aims for. See, the name Lola Soul, well, it was born out of Martin's resolve to not let fear paralyze her from taking chances in her life. So she hopes students will leave with that same boldness. <music>
people have been talking about it for a while. Uh, They're just redeveloping the site. They're redeveloping the site. Prepping it for uh, now, whomever. They haven't talked about anything specific, but we do know they've had other successful commercial ventures mm -hmm. in other parts of the state, uh, down along the river and in Sussex County with both uh, industrial and logistics operations. So uh, we assume that's what they want to do there. Uh, you have a rail there. Mm -hmm. You're close to I-95. You can get to the Port of Philadelphia, the Port of Wilmington, the Port of Baltimore. You can get to the airports fairly easily. So we think uh, that that's probably what they're looking at. But that's that's a good sign because <laughs> there's nobody working there right now. So Governor Carney tried to raise personal income taxes this last round mm -hmm. for the budget. It didn't happen. He called it a missed opportunity. Do you think that? we need to adopt this shared sacrifice attitude and is taxes the only way we're going to get ourselves out of the red? Uh, one, taxes is not the only way you're going to get yourself out of the red. We have a lot of things we need to do, both uh, spending and the revenue side. Uh, we had talked about it and really what he wanted to do was restructure uh, the, the uh, income tax, the mm -hmm. personal income tax and add a, a category on the top uh, with an increase, uh, I think it was two tenths in the tax. Uh, what we argued was we understood that, but he also needs to broaden the base. Are we on the right path? I think we are now. Mm -hmm. I think we are now. Uh, I think people have finally accepted the fact that the corporate structure has changed, mm -hmm. not only here, but in the world, and we're starting to address that. I think there's a good sign DuPont, Dow, or Dow DuPont, uh, you know, two of their main uh, companies are going to be here in Delaware, mm -hmm. plus Comores has been, everybody's worried about Comores, they've been a great success. Okay, Rich Heffron, head of the Delaware State Chamber of Commerce, thank you so much for thank your you. time. You can check out this interview online at whyy.org slash first. Have you seen the new whyy.org? It's our new home for online news from around Delaware. While you're there, log on to whyy.org slash first to check us out. And don't forget to sign up for our e-newsletter as well. Our fingers are crossed for the future success of 16-year-old Morgan Hurd. The gymnast from Middletown surprised lots of people last weekend by winning the gold medal in the all-around at the 2017 World Artistic Gymnastics Championships in Montreal. She returned to her home gym at First State Gymnastics in Newark on Wednesday to lots of cheers. I felt incredible. I was so happy. I started crying, actually. <laughs> The field is like so deep, especially this year, and there's like so many great athletes. I was just like so honored to be able to be even in the presence of them. As the first Delawarean to win a world championship in gymnastics, Hurd is now an inspiration for lots of other girls. I think that we just aspire to be something like that because it's just crazy because we know that she works so hard and she strives for, for perfection like all the time, so that makes all of us really want to like move forward and keep going. For her coach, that winning feeling isn't going away. That was uh, absolutely incredible. I mean, it's been, it's already what, three days for now, but we still, anytime we talk about it, we have a goosebumps in us. We both, we, when it happened, we couldn't sleep the whole entire night. We couldn't, we just been relieving the moments of, uh, of success because uh, the time before that, I mean, you know, the, the, the gymnastics is a tough sport. We, we were dreaming about it and um, we went and did it. She did it. Heard now has her sights set on the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. I can't wait to really um, just start training and learning new skills and polishing every little detail. And we can't wait to see how it all turns out. Now to first experience. Robert Strait has been an artist and a teacher of art for over four decades. Last year, he retired from the University of Delaware, but retirement hasn't slowed him down at all. Robert spends most of his days in his studio working on his art. This week's first experience, we check out his work and the thought behind it. to try and invent my own world and try and make paintings that were my paintings. One of the things that to me about painting that's really inspiring 
is the canvas itself and the way that it's woven. You have these threads that uh, could be woven forever. Something in the physical world can suggest nirvana, you know, going on forever and ever. And canvas to me is kind of like that. When I paint, I'm really thinking about color a lot and the application. How does the paint go on and about the stroke, the brush stroke. Even though you don't see the canvas, it's like remaking the canvas. That's a big part of what I do. That's sort of led to this idea of what about shapes that have certain aspects of math. A lot of the paintings will have uneven sides to them. Most of them have seven or 13 sides. That in itself would uh, perhaps be the start of a painting. I kind of moved away from that when I started doing the paintings that were on slabs of wood. The shape became important, multiple shapes kind of kissing each other. I wanted to make something that was actually three-dimensional. I started thinking about these containers. At some point, a designer made those things. I want to do something with that where people at first may not recognize what it's made from, but they'll, they'll feel like there's some, you know, somehow they know that, oh, that's something I'm familiar with. Paper mache was torn newspaper. This newspaper comes from one day. And so the sculpture becomes a record of that particular day of the year. And even though you can't read the newspaper, it's an indication of history. I hope first that perhaps they're puzzled. You know, they don't know quite what they're looking at, but on the sculptural things, I hope that that question of what am I looking at also makes them start thinking about painting and what painting can be uh, or what it might mean. I think the thing that keeps me going is that it's important to keep evolving and changing and, and pushing yourself always questioning where you are and how it can go beyond that. You can see more of Robert's work at an exhibit at the Delaware Contemporary starting January 12th. Learn more about Robert and see more of his work online at robertstraight.com. Next week on First, the Coastal Zone Act is a good example of Delaware's legacy in dealing with water issues, but what about the future? We explore the next generation of water stewards. And we'll have that story and a whole lot more next time. That is First, though, for this week. We thank you for watching. For Chris Barish, Mark Eichmann, and Nichelle Polston, I'm Shirley Min. Have a great week.